Welcome to Fruit Snacks, a weekday podcast that covers big ideas about the Christian worldview in a bite-sized format. Hey everyone, welcome back to Fruit Snacks. This week, we're going to jump into a new doctrinal topic. It's actually part of a two-week back-to-back series that we're going to do on spiritual beings, what the Bible actually teaches about angels, demons, and all the things in between that we tend to forget about but are super important to a overall uh, biblical worldview and uh, just the the landscape of the spiritual realm. So this first week, we're going to be looking at good spiritual beings, the good guys, and there's more here than I think we may think at first glance. It's not just God and the angels. And then next week, we're going to look at the bad guys, and we're going to talk about all the stuff that's there as well. So first, uh, in this episode, I wanted to start with a group of spiritual beings that I think we are aware of, but we don't talk about a whole heck of a lot. And it's not angels. It's actually a group of spiritual beings that are far superior in their role and in their authority and responsibility than angels. And that would be a group that is referred to in Scripture as sometimes the sons of God in the Old Testament and also the divine counsel. So, Part of why I wanted to bring this up and do this topic is that, as I said, there is far more to the spiritual realm than just angels and demons. And in our modern context, we have tended, I think, uh, to do ourselves a disservice and to truncate and sort of flatten the hierarchy of the spiritual realm and to just make it about a, a couple categories when, in fact, the Bible has a lot more and varied kinds of uh, ways of describing some of these uh, beings. And so when it comes to the sons of God, or as I said, they're sometimes referred to as the divine council or even as the holy ones in the Old Testament, I want us to see that there are several different passages where this group is referred to so that we can get a better sense of who they are, what they are Uh, doing in heaven and what their role and responsibilities are. So in Job 38, 7, we see a reference to God's holy ones. And what this passage is implying about them is not only do they predate creation because they were present at creation, uh, but that the language that gets used here is that they were present at creation and they were rejoicing over it with God, but that they were witnesses to creation. They were not participants in it. And that's an important distinction because these are spiritual beings, as we will see, that have considerable power and authority and responsibility in the heavenly realm, but they are created beings nonetheless, and they're not God. And only God, only Yahweh, participated in creation. In fact, when you go and you study the verbs for creation that are used in the Genesis account, you will often see that there is plural language when it refers to the the number of beings who are there, uh, Elohim, for instance, but the verb that is responsible for the actual creation, bara, is singular. And that should tell us that even though these Uh, holy ones, these sons of God, were present at creation, they were not participating in it. Only God has created. Only God has that power. In Job 1.6, we also see that these holy ones have duties in heaven. We're not told in this particular passage what those duties consist of, although we're going to see that in just a second in other passages. But in Job 1, we see that the sons of God, which is another term for this group, are presenting themselves. They are giving a report about what they've been up to and their progress and their activity and so on and so forth. And a 
Satan character, which we've done a podcast on before, is part of this process, part of this group. So they all have different roles and duties and responsibilities in heaven. In Job 15, 8, we see that God has organized them into a council. Now we may be wondering, why does God need a council? Isn't God wise all by himself? Isn't God omniscient? Doesn't he know everything there is to know? Why in the world does God need input from a council? And we see this same idea that God has a council that he confers with and defers to in Jeremiah 23, 18 and in Psalm 89, 7. So it's absolutely this a biblical idea that God has a council consisting of spiritual beings known as sons of God or holy ones. The question is, why? And what we see in various passages in the Old Testament is that God has given them a participatory role in governing creation with God. So they didn't create, only God did that. But once God created, God gave his heavenly realm, and these beings in particular, a high-level participatory role in how that creation gets governed and run. And it's interesting because that parallels how God gives mankind a high-level participatory role in how the physical creation gets managed and run, with Adam being put in charge of naming the animals and overseeing the garden and things like that. So in three passages I want to share— In Daniel 4.17, we see something interesting, that the judgment for Nebuchadnezzar is pronounced as a judgment of these holy ones, of these watchers, as they are called in this passage. And in the same breath, it is referred to as God's judgment. And so there is this interplay or this equivocation between their decision— to say this is what should happen to Nebuchadnezzar being aligned with God's will. And and it's as if God did it because they are carrying out God's will. In 1 Kings 22, 19 through 23, we see another example of this where God is interested in punishing a wicked king. And he turns to his counsel and basically says, I'm open to ideas here, guys. Well, how should we do it? And it says that a spirit came forward and he he pitched this idea and God says, yeah, that'll work. Go do it. And again, God didn't need this input. It's not as if God couldn't have thought of this on his own, but God, we see here very clearly, gives a participatory role and defers to the ideas of his creatures. In Deuteronomy 32, 8, we actually see that God put some of these sons of God directly over the Gentile nations after Babel and God basically in verse nine said, I'm going to create a nation for myself, Israel, but you all, the sons of God, you are in charge of these nations uh, because I'm done with them and their disobedience. So you handle them and you point them back to me. And so God delegated responsibility over these nations to his sons of God, to his holy ones. So I want us to know about this group because they're going to come up again next week. And they're a very, very important group to know about for uh, all these reasons. And so we're going to continue our discussion on Wednesday by looking at another group that usually gets associated with angels, but are actually, in fact, something completely different. And that is the cherubim and the seraphim. So I hope you'll join me then.